So, uh, as we learned in the first talk, in a couple years, this whole presentation will be dated by the font that I used up top. Uh, so, starting beginning of the year, I knew going in I was going to be having a WebGL year. I did two of my own projects in WebGL, and I had, did a client project as well. And they all happened to be map related, and I thought that might be a great thing to bring and talk about. Uh, so, what is WebGL? WebGL is a web standard for 3D graphics, shows up right in the browser, and it doesn't need a plugin. And you know it's a valid web technology because somebody made a logo for it. That seems to be the benchmark when something is accepted. So uh, I'm going to show you an example real quick. Uh, so this is one of the ones I did this year. So we have a little solar system model right in the browser. I can drag it around. I can click on things. And uh, one of the, come on. One of the things to notice is that there's not really a lot going on here. It's some spheres, some circles, some textures, a little bit of animation. There's a lot you can do with some simple things. Uh, so let me jump back. Uh, if you're going to work in WebGL, I'd highly recommend a framework. I use 3JS. It's, I, I am not capable of doing it on my own without some help. There's another popular one, Babylon JS, that uh, I think Microsoft is in control of. There's a Unity export, an Adobe Animate export, uh, and you can go no framework, um, but that is definitely not me. Uh, so a little breakdown, I'm gonna go through, just show the basics of a scene, rendering a globe with a texture, rendering a terrain, and some tips and tricks for responsive design, usability, and accessibility. So uh, I decided not to code in the meeting, I thought that would be a complete disaster for everybody, including myself. So I put together this little page, flashmapper.com slash tutorials. Um, I'm just going to pop open some of the samples on it to talk to. Everything on it is responsive if you want to follow along on your phone, and then you, know, you can play along with stuff. Uh, I'm just going to jump over there. So uh, basics of a scene. Uh, this is done as a tutorial you can do, but let's just not talk about code. Um, so there are a couple basic things for a scene. You need a scene that you can put objects in. You need um, a renderer that's going to take your scene and translate it into pixels on the screen, a camera to know where to view the scene from, and something to look at. And in this case, it is a, uh, just an axis. The green axis is Y, the red axis is X, and the blue axis is Z coming towards you. And you also need uh, a controller to move the camera around, so if I start dragging, you're going to see this axis start moving around. Uh, so then you, you can put, start putting objects and shapes in. Uh, so this is just going to be a gray sphere at first. If you're going to, have an ob if you're going to make objects, you first need um, a geometry, which defines the shape, a material that describes how it's covered, the colors, what it's going to look like, how light interacts with it, and a mesh that's going to bring them all together. So then you can take that and wrap a texture around it. And it's real easy for cartographers if you're doing globes because you just need a raster with no projection on it. And it wraps just fine around the globe. So I've added two here. We've got a little texture on our globe to make it look like Earth. And we've got a big one in the background to be a galaxy where the texture is wrapped on the inside of the sphere. Uh, you can take objects, rotate them, position them. Uh, rotating, I always get a little bit confused by which I should rotate it on. I found a good trick is um, if you think about these bars, these axis bars coming in, which bar would I take and I would twist? Which one would you twist to rotate it the way you want to go? So now our Earth's got a little tilt, and that blue Z axis is the one that I would kind of twist and turn like a handle. Uh, you can animate every time the scene renders. You can increment some kind of variable to make it animate. I'm just going to jump had a little bit. So now uh, a little bit of rotation on the z-axis every time it renders, and now our little Earth is spinning. And this one I've got a little sun added. You can see a little, little model coming together. Uh, there is, um, a, there's a great trick in here. Uh, so let's just say I want to make that Earth go around the sun. I could very painfully try and get x, y coordinates to go all the way around in a circle. But uh, they've got a great trick. They have these empty containers called groups. You can take your object, put it in a group, extend it out, and then spin your group around on the z-axis. 
and it makes it so much easier because I am not good enough with the math to do this uh, without some tricks. Uh, and the last piece I have here is uh, some lighting. So there are two types of lights in this scene. We've got, um, there's a point light, so there's a light at the actual sun that's a point that shines out in all directions. And uh, there's an ambient light for the, that uh, everything in the scene takes so that you're, um, you know, this, this would be pitch black on the backside. So now you've got, with not a whole lot, a little Earth moving around the sun in a little solar system. The second one I have here is uh, some terrains. So uh, the hardest part about a terrain is going from the DEM into something that WebGL can read. I have, there, are a couple, there are a bunch of different ways to do it. I have some links here. Uh, I'm not going to focus a ton on it because it gets, gets a little complicated. Um, I'm just going to jump straight to a preview of it. So I have a little section here, uh, a terrain of Denali. So this is taking the terrain and reading it. It's trying to make a mesh. It's, it takes a little bit. I kind of resampled it a little too high. Come on. Oh, don't embarrass me. Oh, there it goes. OK. So it, it looks like a black, just a black mass from up here. But if I start zooming in, you can see there definitely is a terrain here. Uh, so what happens is it's taking all those little elevation points, and it's making this triangle mesh of it. Uh, and just you know, from the way it's trying to render all the lines, you can see the, the terrain. This was built off of a 5-meter DEM. I uh, resampled it down to 50, and it's still pretty good. Uh, so now, I, in QGIS, I rendered a hill shade for it. And uh, terrain textures are pretty easy. You just need a raster image that's the same dimensions as the DEM you're working with. So now we've got a, a hill shade mapped on it. You can see some glacial flows. And then I have one last one where I built in some land cover. Uh, so just some flat land cover with that uh, hill shade on it. You've got a pretty nice little terrain. And as long as your, as long as your texture is detailed enough, you can get away with a pretty, with a pretty low uh, resolution elevation. All right, so I'll jump back. Tips and tricks, responsive design, usability, and accessibility. So when I was in e-learning, my instructional designers would always come to me with their content and say, this can't be responsive. It's too complicated. You cannot make this responsive. And the way I, I kept telling them to look at it was, just imagine your device or your browser is a window into an environment. And just think about uh, what properties of this do you need to shift to make those windows sizes work. Uh, thoughts about you know, how much content can be on the screen at one time. Um, you know, it'd be easy to just scale everything up with the browser, but if you're large, you have the chance to add some more items for some context, or things that are hidden away in panels small can just be up all the time. Um, and the, the best tip I found is plan for it up front. If you try and shove it in at the end, it just doesn't work very well. So for example, in this scene, uh, the planets actually shift positions depending on if you're vertical or horizontal. This is built with a JSON configuration file, so I had to design that JSON up front to be able to shift things around responsively. And if I tried to do it at the end, it just, it just wouldn't really work. So usability. I am in UX. I have to involve this now. It's part of the job description. Uh, so navigating a 3D scene can be difficult on the web, especially since um, you could be using a mouse or a keyboard or on a touch screen, or on, you know, the inputs for each of those are different. Uh, one of the tricks I do is I try and put navigation points, you know, in the camera frame. Uh, down at the beach, I gave this to my grandmother, who's in her 80s, and she actually navigated 3D scene well, so I felt, I felt pretty good about that. Um, make sure your click or tap areas are large enough to casually select. So one of the tricks is um, you don't actually click on planets here. You click on these invisible, I made them, they're kind of, they're kind of light red these invisible click areas. So there's Pluto when you're at the start, Pluto when you're in the scene. And that actually changes size as the camera moves through the scene based off of how far away they are so that you can you know, really easily tap on things. Um, and like responsiveness, plan for it up front. I like to put usability in my workflows. Um, and you can do it cheaply. There's a, there's a technique somebody taught me, guerrilla user testing, where you put on a badge or make up a fake one, go down to a bus stop, and people will talk to you until their bus shows up. 
and it's great. <laughs> you will get so much great reaction. And I, I, I hate to say it because I used to do it too. Usability testing, you can't, like, I used to just walk around the office and show people, and it just doesn't, it, you just don't get the kind of, you know, react, critical reaction you really need to. So accessibility, there's a UX uh, accessibility um, presenter I saw once, Clarissa Peterson, and she had a line, uh, HTML is by default accessible. If you make something in HTML and it's not accessible, you broke it. It's supposed to be accessible, it's in the spec. Uh, so I try and think about accessibility a lot. We had to in e-learning, uh, it, was, it was just required for the product. Uh, thinking about if somebody has to use a keyboard, they can tab logically through it. You know, make sure if you're, if you're tabbing through buttons, make sure buttons are there for, all, for as much of the functionality as you can, and just make sure that people can actually get to all your content uh, using just a keyboard. And again, uh, plan for it up front. Uh, we used to try and build focus dates at the end, and it always looked weird and messy. Uh, so I make that part of the initial design effort. What's the focus date gonna look like? Do we have enough contrast? Uh, last piece, closing. Uh, while I was building this deck, Tom Patterson put this uh, post up, this pencil shaded Maui relief that he made a long time ago. And uh, the client project I did, I happened to have on my desktop elevation for all of Hawaii. So I asked him, can I take a shot at uh, using this? He said, sure, it's on my iPhone. I'm not sure it's gonna work that well. Uh, so I made a little Maui uh, elevation piece real quick. So here's Tom's uh, pencil shaded relief, and I'm gonna start dragging. And now Tom's hand-drawn shaded relief. It actually, actually lines up pretty good. You can see some lava fields and flows. And uh, uh, once you start getting used to it, it took maybe 20, 30 minutes. I used QGIS to georeference his original picture. Uh, so that's pretty much all I've got. Uh, time for questions? Okay, sure. Any questions? Ooh, right in front of me. So that was really great. Uh, thank you very much. I've, sure. I've played with 3JS a little bit too, and I'm curious why you chose not to render the shading in 3JS. The shading? Yeah. Uh, just because, um, you know, I, I do think about mobile a lot and slower processors, and if you pre-render all the shadows and things, it's just much easier on the scene. All right. Oh, and it, it also, you also can get away with a much lower resolution, like, terrain. Thanks a lot. Um, can you pretty easily add vector data as well, say, points of interest in the terrain map? So, uh, let me pop open. It's, it's, I think, personally, I think it's tougher. Uh, this is another piece I did this year. Um, takes a little longer to load. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a uh, this is M uh, Magellan's route. These points were actually really easy to do because uh, I used that I used that trick with the with the container, where I just rotated the container latitude longitude. The line probably took me two weeks to try and uh, figure out how to plot it because it has to be in 3D around the globe. It can't just be you know draw a line on two axes. Uh, I thought it was a little harder. You can, but it, it, is, it is trickier. You, I, I couldn't use any of the cheats on it. Okay, I think that's all we have time for right now. So thank you.